Sarah, um, thank you for doing all the work that you've done, particularly for this evening and coming here and, and for the great work, scholarly work you've done. And this is Sarah Day, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ken, for that very generous introduction, and thank you all for coming. Um, I hasten to say I'm not an expert on conservation, but I've learned a great deal because I was commissioned to write an article on Harriet Freeman and Edward Everett Hale's collaboration on saving the uh, forests of the White Mountains, the presidential range of the White Mountains, which is something that's not really known about Hale, um, as I'll tell you. So, um, well, obviously, it's a great pleasure to talk to you this evening in the reopened Hale House. And uh, lest you think that I just stepped off the boat, uh, Stephen and I have been here together for 46 years. And it may have Not something. <laughs> and it may have something to do with the fact that we're together and, you know, neither of us lets the other one, um, you know, use a lovely American accent. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and I spent most of the, these, lo these 46 years researching um, and writing about American history, which makes my accent even more questionable. <laughs> but, you know, it's the outsider thing. Um, so, Hale and Harriet Freeman's uh, pioneering collaboration on forest conservation and land preservation in the White Mountains in the early 20th century is my subject. Uh, this is just one aspect, little known until now, of their remarkable relationship and accomplishments. Hopefully you will want to buy the book, some of you already have, thank you, um, to read the wider story, which I can only touch on this evening. If I can hit the right button here. Many of you know that Hale and his sister Susan were amateur botanists and gardeners, a passion they came to share with Hale's romantic and intellectual partner, Harriet Freeman. For several years after they fell in love, Hale would write Freeman long letters describing the beautiful landscape surrounding his summer house, from the uninterrupted view across pastures to the sea to wash pond behind. He also told her about his and his family's joy and their freedom from Boston's exhausting demands and social conventions, as well as the varied outdoor life that he and his family were able to live and um, enjoy in the area. He even made line drawings for her of the layout of the first floor of the house and the arrangement of the furnishings in his office, which were helpful for the restoration, particularly, do I, dare I say it, as you were considering running the disabled ramp up into the Holy of Holies, his <laughs> Edward Everett Hale's office, where he wrote a good proportion of his books and articles. Harry, Hattie Freeman made her first visit to this house in late August 1887 at the age of 40, following a searing tragedy in her own family, which I'll refer to later. She made at least three subsequent visits, but never when Hale's family was there, other than his loyal sister, Susan, who managed the house and actually had much in common with Hattie Freeman, their love of botany being one thing. Hale was overjoyed that Hattie understood the happiness he always felt in the area, telling her after her first visit, Matunuk is for me a sort of temple consecrated to nature. So that much used quote actually comes from one of his letters to, to Harriet Freeman. Uh, now, isn't that an appropriate image? <laughs> That's pretty direct. <laughs> <laughs> Hale on the cover of a, the, the magazine that was actually Forest and Irrigation, but they briefly renamed it Conservation. And I think you'll see why. That was August 1909, uh, two months after he died. Hale and Freeman's shared love of nature and outdoor life only increased over the long years of their relationship, but it was not yet time to preserve the land and historic buildings of Matunuk. That task fell to others over a century later, many of whom are here this evening. Instead, Hale and Freeman turned their energies to saving the forests and rivers of New Hampshire's White Mountains, as I will describe and as this commemorative cover image of him indicates. My article on this subject will appear in this winter's edition of Appalachia, the journal of the Appalachian Mountain Club. We all know where we are. By the time the Hale family moved into this house in the summer of 1873, young Harriet Freeman, who was born in Boston in 1847, was working in Hale's church in Boston's South End, 
In 1879, she became a member of the Appalachian Mountain Club, probably as a result of studying geology with some of the founding members and leaders of that organization, who were professors at Boston Tech, later MIT, where she was a student in the Teachers' School of Science. Hale also became a member of the Appalachian Mountain Club and would be president for a year in 1895. I don't, didn't see from the um, journals that he was a very active president, but it was a very hard year for him. That was the year that his adored son, Robbie, died. He had first explored the White Mountains as a junior member of the New Hampshire Geological Survey in 1841 when he was 19. It was apparently on a trip in 1871 to the beautiful Waterville Valley with Hale and members of his domestic and church family that Hattie admitted to herself her attraction to her much older minister. I'm sure you will recognize that. Wash Pond. From the beginning of the Hale family's summers here, Hale took enormous pleasure in the beautiful South County countryside and loved canoeing alone or with members of his large family on Wash Pond behind the house. It was Hale who persuaded Hattie Freeman to study botany, and during the early years of their romance, he would fill his letters to her with descriptions of the countryside, family life, and drawings of the local botanical specimens that he picked and examined under the microscope. Of course, he was here with Mrs. Hale and his family, so um, there were many letters that went sh shooting up to New Hampshire, where Hattie's uh, family summer home was. She would apparently do the same, although her letters are missing for the first five years of their illicit relationship. She'd ordered him to burn them. If I had had you with me, he wrote after one evening paddle, I would have shown you the loveliest mysterious vista between the trees down on the other pond, and I would have made you guess out the mysterious form of my old Indian, who is a vague, strange-shaped maple of different colour from the trees around him. Their shared love of trees would be the basis of their conservationist collaboration during Hale's final years. They both spent time studying horticulture at the Massachusetts Agricultural College in Amherst, today's University of Massachusetts. But how did Hale and Freeman meet, and at what point did their collegial friendship burst into mutually committed support and love? I realize that some of you may have read my book or heard me speak about this before, so I'll be brief. In fact, how many of you already know that story? <laughs> yeah, I thought so. <laughs> um, right. This was the Freeman family's townhouse on Union Park in Boston South End, just a block and a half from Hale's church, the South Congregational Church. The Freemans moved into this house and joined Hale's Unitarian Congregation in 1861. Hattie would live here for most of the next 60 years. When Hale moved his family to a large house in Roxbury in 1869, Emily Hale had given birth to their ninth and last child that year, Mrs. Freeman invited him to take lunch and his afternoon nap in their house whenever it suited him. That was Hattie's mother. He would become very close to all the Freemans during the church season. The Freemans began to spend their summers in the country house Mrs. Freeman inherited from her mother, in bucolic pepperel on the Massachusetts New Hampshire border. In the fall of 1863, in the middle of the Civil War, the year after this photo was taken, Harriet Freeman was formally introduced to the Freeman's minister, 41 year old Edward Everett Hale, when he called on his new parishioners for the first time. Hattie was then 16. Here she is with her little cousin, Helen Atkins. Hale would publish his most enduring short story, The Intensely Patriotic, A Man Without a Country, just a month or so later. In the wake of the Civil War, he became a prominent national leader of the Unitarian Church, an active social reformer, and a prolific and popular writer, editor, and lecturer. By the late 1870s, Hattie was his favorite literary amanuensis, or secretary, working with him on his short stories and books and taking dictation for more than half his sermons. And they are in the archives in her ha wonderful, round, clear handwriting. 